Next is launching a virtual classroom unlike any other. Next is finding new ways to learn for students of all ages. Next is making sure those who need COVID tests get them. With ASU Innovation, it's time to look forward to what's next. Human brain is the most complicated object in the known universe. It's more complicated than the working of a star. It's more complicated than solar systems. It's more complicated than the objects in galaxies. I have a dream. I can't imagine that nature, whatever you believe, nature or the creator, put that thing between your two ears so that you would use some tiny percentage of it. I can't believe that that's the case. The notion of education being for a few people, that's absurd. That is literally absurd. Our why, our reason for existence is to construct the public university which is serving the success of the democracy the success of the people and their families directly with intent, with purpose, with differentiation, with responsibility, with measurement, with creativity, with all the things that we can bring to bear. That's what this is about. If you think about the audaciousness of that, that an institution says it's going to take fundamental responsibility for society, for someone like me, I want to be part of that. Every single one of us is a one of a kind, we exist on Earth for this brief period of time, and that one unique opportunity that you have cannot be wasted. It needs to be maximized to its fullest extent. What does it mean for us to be able to say, we have something for you, specifically for you and for the six other people in your small town? I think that's one of the things that gets missed, is the fact that we can reach 10 million people or we can reach 10 people and all of them get the same kind of engagement from us and the same kinds of commitments to say, we want to help you create a future of your own making. Access and excellence. And we need to give access. We need to create inclusive communities, but it's because that's going to make us all more excellent in our sciences and in our ability to use our scientific knowledge to solve grand challenges. The dual pursuit of access and excellence is not just operationally expedient, it's not just economically expedient, it's not just fiscally expedient, it's morally expedient. It's the path to a meaningful social progress for this country and for the world. To take an institution and reorient it to a social impact is something that is what universities should be about, but we've forgotten about. I think we're at a time where higher ed has to transform. We have to. We can't keep going with our old ways. And I think that ASU is incredibly well positioned to make that change as we lean into the future. We have to take on responsibility. So this notion of taking on responsibility is really, really important. We have to change the world now. We have to change it now. We cannot wait. And ASU is the place that says, you have to change it now. What do you need to take it to the next level? It is important that we have models. It is important that young people look and say, oh, I belong there. So that gives me great joy and the responsibility of knowing that it's my shoulders they're gonna stand on. I often tell them, I'm just holding the space for you. I am holding this space for you. And when you're ready, I'll be ready to go. I felt like I was bringing my personality and like my value to this school. And I felt like I was a part of something that was gonna be really big. My voice has been something that I have discovered within the years. And it's something that I will forever be grateful what you can achieve here is limited only by your imagination. It's a really unique situation to be here at ASU. It's like being in the front seat 
of the educational revolution. What we learn here has a potential to influence the entire globe and humans living everywhere. What would make me happiest would be that the cultural changes are so dramatic that the institution continues to design and redesign and morph its design going forward and becomes this truly adaptive institution really working on social outcomes rather than working on individual university or individual faculty outcomes. What drives me is this notion of the individual human and the individual human mind being able to become this powerful force. You know, we've, we've dreamt about this in art and literature and culture for thousands of years, and we're just now to the point where I'm 100% convinced that we can make it happen.
Greetings from Tempe. My name's Brian Brayboy, and I'm a member of the Lumbee Tribe and, and director of the Center for Indian Education. I want to welcome you to our webinar series. I'm really thrilled with what the team has put together over the, over the coming months as we begin to do this. So let me tell you how we got here. Um, a few years ago, we started planning the 60th anniversary for our center. Uh, and as we emerge into our 61st and then our 62nd year, um, in the midst of planning for this, we had a global health pandemic that exposed many other things along with it as well, which really forced us to rethink what we wanted to do. And while we wanted to gather in person, it did not seem the prudent thing for us to do. So. But we also didn't want to miss a Diamond Jubilee. There, how many research centers actually celebrate a 60th anniversary? So we decided we were going to do this series of, of webinars and conversations that are really focused both on the past, the present, and the future of indigenous education. And so that's how we ended up up here. I'm really glad that you have decided to join us for one or all of these. They're going to be exciting and, and interesting and, and um, I know that the team has put a lot of thought into them. Let me back up again. Um, I am coming to you from Tempe, which is sits on the ancestral homelands of the Akamel Alatham and Peeposh peoples. There were certainly other communities, other tribal communities and peoples who utilized the space because of the, um, the verdant river that was really flowing through um, here that flowed all the way to the the Sea of, of Cortez. So we're coming to you from that and, and recognize that with this recognition, there is a certain level of responsibility that the institution has to those peoples. And in some ways, that's where the Center for Indian Education comes in. We were founded in 1959 at the time to really try to meet the educational, cultural, and social needs of tribal uh, communities and children. And to be perfectly honest with you, 61 years later, that's precisely what we intend to do. Our scope is widened. We serve the 22 tribal nations and communities in what is now the state of Arizona, but we have uh, partnerships across the U.S. and we've got partnerships in um, Canada and in New Zealand and Australia and other places that, that are emerging. So we have gone global in some ways, um, but really our heart is in in Arizona and in the and in the U.S. in terms of the work that that we do, we continue to want to serve the educational, social, and cultural needs of tribal communities. Importantly, our job is to work with those communities to create futures of their own making. We don't determine what those futures are. What we have is a particular capacity to be able to do research, to write policy, to think about other kinds of work and we bring those assets to communities in service to them. It is one of the unique hallmarks of our center that has been around for 61 years. Um, we host the Journal of American Indian Education, which is now in, it's, it's about to enter into its 60th volume year, which is a pretty remarkable thing. We set policy, we write policy papers for different organizations, um, some affiliated with tribal governments, some with the federal government in the U.S., others for private foundations and others for scientific organizations. We train students, we prepare indigenous students to go out and create a future of their own making, but many of them are focused on also making meaning um, and making futures for their own tribal nations. That's a really important piece of what we do. And as I said, we, we, we publish the journal. So we are focused on research, policy, and publication and remain doing that and really hope that we will do that for the next 60 years as well. I've had the pleasure of being the director of the center, co-director or director of the center since 2000 and nine and we'll look forward to transitioning at some point in the near in the near future um, without any further ado i want to thank our sponsor uh, the spencer foundation uh, for their generous support being able to do this work and i'm really just so excited about the work that um, and the webinars that you will be engaging in so welcome
take care of yourself and looking forward to when we can gather again in person. Take care. Hi, it's Brian Brayboy, Director of the Center for Indian Education at Arizona State University. Welcome to uh, number four in our series of um, celebrating 60 years of, of our center. This one is called The Future of Indigenous Education, and I have the pleasure of introducing to you Dr. Ananda Moran, who's an assistant professor at UCLA. Um, Dr. Moran has a quite a uh, impressive resume. She did her undergraduate at Yale University, has a master's from Harvard, and did her PhD in learning sciences at, at Northwestern. And she has this amazing research agenda where she's really looking at the socio-cultural dimensions of learning and development, um, primarily among indigenous populations. But I think one of the things that excites me about her research is that she is focused on the ways in which intergenerational learning happens between different generations, children and adults, children and, and elders, and vice versa. And I think she's really charting a new way forward in this, and she and others are really driving this area of inquiry. And I think there's something really important about it as we think about the next 60 years and the work. So she has an amazing um, uh, resume, as I've said, but I think one of the things I want to say to you is that, that as accomplished as she is, as remarkable as she is as a professional, she is a genuinely decent, great human being. As great as she is as a researcher, she's a better human being. I've known her for a long time. I really admire her and look up to her. I'm grateful that she's uh, agreed to do the moderation for um, for this session, and I hope you'll join me in welcoming Dr. Ananda Marin. Thank you, Dr. Brayboy, for your kind introduction and for your mentorship over the past 13 or so years. Dr. Brayboy, I appreciate your leadership and the labor you do to benefit Indigenous education today, tomorrow, and for tomorrow's futures. The Center for Indian Education and the Journal of American Indian Education has played a formative role in my own development as a scholar, and I want to express my appreciation to the many leaders of CIE who have nurtured Indigenous education, scholarship, programs, and practice, and thus work to make sure that future generations of Indigenous educators have a home place in the university. Brian, you are one of those leaders and I am grateful to you for your care and for the generosity of your spirit and time. And thank you for your leadership in making this celebration of 60 years of indigenous excellence a reality in this very challenging past year. Greetings everyone and welcome to the fourth of five webinars celebrating the 60th year of the Center for Indian Education, the CIE at Arizona State University celebrating all that CIE represents for the field of Indigenous education. I want to thank all the CIE 60th Planning Committee, Dr. Colin Ben, Dr. Deborah Chadwick, Taylor Nota, Andrea Underwood, and Jeannie Colquette. CIE Associate Director, Dr. Colin Ben, will be reading questions from the audience during the question and answer period. Thanks too to all of you who are live streaming. For those of you watching on ASU Live, Please submit questions to the School of Social Transformation YouTube website, asu-sst-youtube, where the top window has the title of this event, The Future of Indigenous Education, plus live. We honor the lands of the center and the indigenous territories where we are located. I'm coming to you from Tavangar, the Los Angeles Basin and Southern Channel Islands, and the homelands of the Tongva peoples. As a faculty member at UCLA, I am grateful to have the opportunity to work with and for Tarahatum, Indigenous peoples in Los Angeles. Today, the Tongva people continue to maintain their political sovereignty and cultural traditions. They are vital members of the Los Angeles community. I acknowledge their tremendous contributions to the Los Angeles region and thank them for their stewardship. As a teacher and learner at a land-grant institution, I invite us to pay our respects to Honukvatum ancestors, Ahiharum elders, and Iyohikim, our relatives, past, present, and emerging. I also recognize my responsibility for learning the histories of this place and drawing on the work of Charles Saboveda, learning how to be a good relative as well as a Kuyum guest. It is my profound honor to introduce today's panelists. I'm inspired by their scholarship and their work in indigenous education has informed my own learning as a researcher and educator.
I'll introduce them in the order in which they will begin. We have opening questions to which each panelist will take about five minutes to respond. Then we look forward to rich back and forth dialogue among the panelists. Then time is reserved for question and answer dialogue, responding to questions and comments from all of you, our audience. Welcome to you all. We are so pleased to have you with us today in this virtual space. Our first panelist, Dr. Valerie Shirley Denae, is an assistant professor of indigenous education and the director of the indigenous teacher education program at University of Arizona. She received her PhD in curriculum studies from Purdue University and MS degree in curriculum and instruction from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Upon receiving her BA degree in elementary education from Arizona State University, she taught in two elementary schools located in two native communities in Arizona. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Shirley. Our second panelist, Dr. Gerald jo Daryl Joseph, is Hopi from the village of Monkapi of the Hopi tribe and representative of Water Coyote Clan. He is an assistant professor in the Department of Educational Specialties in the College of Education at Northern Arizona University. His research is focused on the intersection of disability with sociocultural differences that inform educational inequities for American Indian and Alaska Native youth. His work aims to advance opportunities for individuals with disabilities to persist in education, health and wellness, and cultural well being through the lens of resilience. In addition to serving as faculty, he is currently involved with the nationally funded project, the American Indian Vocational Rehabilitation Training and Technical Assistance Center to serve 88 American Indian and Alaska Native Vocational Rehabilitation Service programs with programming initiatives focused on workforce development for tribal community members with disabilities. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Joseph. Our third panelist, Dr. Leilani Subzalian Alutik is an assistant professor of indigenous studies and education and co-director of the Subsequela education program at the University of Oregon. Her research focuses on creating spaces to support indigenous self-determination in education. Her publications, including her book, Indigenous Children's Survivance in Public Schools, aim to affirm indigenous peoples and equip educators to challenge colonialism in curriculum, policy, and practice. She also collaborates with the Office of Indian Education in Oregon to develop professional development on tribal history, shared history, a law that mandates the inclusion of Native students curriculum in all K through 12 Oregon public schools. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Subzalian. In the first webinar, Teresa McCarty, my friend and mentor, outlined a really nice history of the center. I want to borrow liberally from that history. In 1959, what is now known as Arizona had been a US state for only 47 years, while more than 22 tribal nations and communities had occupied these lands since time immemorial. The US Supreme Court's ruling in Brown v. Board of Education was five years old. With not a trace of school desegregation on the horizon, particularly in Indian education, a cascade of bills to terminate tribal sovereignty and seize more Indian land churned through Congress and the federal government had launched a coercive Indian relocation campaign. In 1959, ASU had just changed its name from Arizona State College to Arizona State University. In Terry's eloquent words, it was a time of entrenched racism and colonialism, but also a time to dream and to act. Dr. Robert A. Russell Jr., his wife, Ruth Russell Denae, and other native leaders and grassroots tribal citizens established at ASU what would become the first center for Indian education, research, teaching, and outreach in the United States. Robert Russell and one of the center's first students, Dr. Peterson Zhao, who would go on to become the first Navajo Nation president, wrote this about the center's mission, Native Communities in Action for Native Education Self-Determination. Each of our panelists have in their own and overlapping ways collaborated with tribal communities to engage in forms of self-determination. For 62 years, the center has organized convenings, dialogues like this one, and community-engaged programs to create an architecture that supports continuous movement toward the future of indigenous education. That is our focus in today's webinar. I'll begin by asking each of the panelists to take about five minutes to address this question. What brought you into this work? Who has profoundly impacted your thinking? Who inspires you now? Dr. Shirley will start with you, followed by Dr. Joseph, and then Dr. Subzalian. 
Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. And also thank you to Dr. Brayboy, as well as the center for inviting me to be on this uh, unique panel that focuses on the future of indigenous education. I am coming to you from uh, Tucson, which is the uh, ancestral, ancestral homelands of the Donna Otum. It's also the place where the Uema peoples have a longstanding history and currently call home. In responding to these questions, um, there's three separate questions and, you know, it was, it took some time to really think and conceptualize how I could answer it in five minutes. So um, I have to first situate the kind of work that I do. And what I do at the University of Arizona is I prepare Native American teachers to teach in schools serving Native students in Native communities. And so when we think about that context, we're also thinking about the indigenous epistemologies, knowledge, um, languages, values that all exist there, as well as the socio cultural and political context of those communities. Mm -hmm. So what we've done in the program that we've created at the University of Arizona, it's called the Indigenous Teacher Education Program. And it's co-founded by Dr. Jeremy Garcia and I and in, in 2016. So in bringing native teachers to our program and getting them certified in elementary education, we needed to really work to reconceptualize and restructure the program that, that would um, really take and, uh, into consideration those unique needs of our communities. So we've developed a framework and the components of that framework is what really guided us into reconceptualizing the program, but it guided us into every aspect of the program, meaning that um, from the courses we taught to every activity that we have to um, preparing the teachers to also embrace and embody this framework, um, so we had to really sit down and think about how we might do that. And so the framework consists of four different components. The first one is teachers as nation builders, native nation builders. The second one is privileging and promoting indigenous knowledge systems, languages, and values. The third one is drawing on critical indigenous theories and pedagogies. And then the last one is uh, developing a justice-centered lens in education. So in thinking about um, what brought me into this work, I, had, I think about um, myself, you know, growing up on the Navajo Nation in a community, Ganado, Arizona, and, you know, the kind of schooling experiences that I had, I'm considering that. I taught in two schools serving Native students. And, you know, in those teaching and learning experiences, the, the, the Diné uh, values, languages, and knowledge systems were typically marginalized or didn't exist in the schooling structures. So I, um, you know, I, I really felt like I needed to um, really do that kind of work within, within what I currently do now. So um, in critically analyzing those experiences, I've also, been informed by my own dissertation research, which worked with Diné youth in reconceptualizing their identities in relation to the histories of um, boarding schools and those policies and practices that were informed by racist ideologies. And then the Diné um, long walk period in the 1860s as well. I also integrated Diné creation stories and philosophies into this work. So that collective work with the youth, I think really informed the next steps of what I would do in teacher education. And, you know, I had to really think about the who of the, you know, who impact, impacted my thinking. And of course, um, grounding my, my own identity, I have to, um, say that it was my parents as well as my grandparents and family members and relatives who have instilled those Diné uh, teachings from a really young age that had continued to guide my thought processes moving forward. It also, I was also informed by the many different scholars, particularly 
to those who paved the pathway in critical Indigenous education. And their scholarship continues to uh, be included in ITEP and shape the next generation of teachers that we are preparing currently. Um, we have individuals like Janina Lomawaima, who served on my dissertation committee at Purdue, and Teresa McCarty. We continue to draw on to the book To Remain an Indian that they co-authored together as a way to really um, think critically about the schooling structures that exist. And historically, all of those ideologies that inform these policies. And of course, we have the um, Jennifer Danette Dale, Sandy Grande, Brian Brayboy, and Tiffany Lee, I think is someone who we continue to draw on her concept of critical indigenous consciousness. And as teachers and preparing them, how do we develop that in the classrooms and what kind of curriculum do we create? What kind of um, schooling experiences do we provide for our students in order to, for that uh, critical indigenous consciousness to be developed and cultivated within our, our classrooms. So there are numerous people who inspire me, but I think overall, collect, overall I would say that it's the youth who inspire me. Um, youth in particular like Auden Pelche, Nalan Pike, my own daughters, Sunway and Michaela, um, but I think the youth have, have the ability to move us in certain ways, in, in really intentional ways that sustain our indigenous life ways. So Adam Pelche and Nalan Pike, for example, they're water and land protectors. And, um, you know, how, when we're working to prepare teachers, how do we get um, our own students to understand their own relationship to water, to land, to community. And so I think, you know, it, it requires a really unique lens in order for that to happen. So collectively, each of those experiences, the people collectively who've influ influenced and inspired my, my work is really about protecting our indigenous communities, land, water, and languages. Thank you, Dr. Shirley. Um, for sharing just a little bit of your personal story and reminding us how the youth in our lives motivate us to do the work that we do and find joy in our work. Dr. Joseph, I want to go to you now. Good morning. Um, good afternoon for, for um, to all of you out there. Thank you again to uh, the Center for the Invitation to be part of this prestigious um, room of panelists um, and then also to be a part of the continuing symposiums um, that um, have been uh, presented to, to all of us. Um, I think it offers a wealth of information for us to really, I think, um, you know, confirm some of the things that we know about as indigenous communities um, and, and kind of help us leverage what we're trying to do in our respective spaces to um, uh, add to that and, and look out for our youth as um, Dr. Shirley has indicated. Um, and so with that said, uh, the picture behind me is uh, my, my place, uh, my home, Munukapi. It's where I come from. Um, I'm at Northern Arizona University. And in that respective place, we sit at the base of the San Francisco Peaks or Nuvatikel Ovi. Um, and it's homeland sacred to our Hopi people and other um, tribes throughout our region here. And so in, in re honoring that, I, I do want to say that, you know, we respect our past and our present and our future generations who have lived here for millennia. Uh, and will continue to forever call this place home. Um, so with that said, uh, you know, as Shirley indicated, I mean, Dr. Shirley had indicated we, um, that there's so much to share in this first question. Um, so I'm gonna, try to, I'm gonna try to cut it short here, but uh, basically, you know, one of the things that, you know, my current work has really positioned me to do is, is take the lens of, in, of resilience from an indigenous perspective. Um, and, and use that to explore the dimensions of what well-being is for our Native American communities um, with the focus on American Indian youth um, with disabilities. Uh, so engaging in that work, I, I 
involve myself in implementing community-based participatory um, approaches uh, to really sustain this, this idea of respect and responsibility to our communities um, as we learn about um, those that we're, we're gathering information from. Uh, and so in doing so, I, you know, I have to take a step back also to look at my own history. Um, as I started my trek into higher education, um, I started in a small town of Tuba City, which is just north of, of my village behind me, um, and graduated from there. And, you know, thinking about that time, um, most immediate to me, my inf influences were my parents. Um, and of course, my siblings and uh, my extended kinship family, uh, my, my own water coyote family, my, all my aunties and daddies on the Snow Clan side um, that are out there. Um, but when I graduated from high school, um, I really had a limited awareness of the opportunities with career choices. Um, so I, I'm sure some of you have the same experience. Um, I went with what my parents did. Uh, my parents had, my father had his degree in uh, business administration, so I pursued that uh, my first semester here at NAU and found that it wasn't for me, you know, it just didn't fit um, what I wanted to do and um, changed my major immediately after the first semester and, uh, and went into special ed because that's my, the background of, of my mother. Um, and not knowing, you know, that there's anthropology, there's engineering, you know, I, I just didn't have that knowledge um, leaving um, high school. Um, and so, you know, I stuck with education and completed my degree in special ed and elementary ed and eventually completed my master's in ed leadership with an emphasis in disability studies. Uh, but also during that time, the historical component of, um, you know, growing up with my family, my brother um, was a large influence on me because, you know, I grew up with him um, for part of my life until my mother made a very difficult decision to um, transition him from Tuba City um, to Tucson, Arizona, which is, you know, a long ways drive from, from the rural reservation town. And the reason being is that he had he experiences multiple disabilities and particularly um, experiences um, living with deafness. Um, and so he went to the Arizona State School for the Deaf and Blind since he was 10 years old. Um, so he had that, you know, uh, the remnants of the experiences of living in a boarding school system. And on my end, um, you know, having the experience of being um, disconnected from my older brother. And so, you know, in my current experience, I think about that when I, uh, we question, you know, the aspects of um, equity, access, you know, social justice, et cetera, and what that means for this particular community. Um, and so that was one piece of my experience. The other is, you know, looking at returning home um, to my community, as some of you, uh, many of us hear the stories of, um, you know, in, in our Hopi community, we say, um, and you hear that many times over, and I'm sure some of you can guess what that means, but uh, it's the message of go and get your education and come back and help your people. Um, and so when I returned home to teach, I um, didn't quite really understand as Dr. Shirley indicated this critical consciousness, the component of what that really meant for me as a Hopi member, as a Hopi educator, um, until I actually um, expanded my worldview um, with the honor of being part of the Americans for Indian Opportunities um, program um, out of Albuquerque, New Mexico under the the leadership and founder of, of the program, uh, Dr. I mean, uh, Ms. LaDonna Harris, and we know her as Mama LaDonna. Um, and, and she presented this, these concepts that we're all familiar with, you know, relationship, um, reciprocity, responsibility, and redistribution. Um, and so I really connected with that um, and what that meant for me when I was working as a teacher back home and um, realized that uh, my experiences there were not the experiences of what I've read in the literature. Um, you know, what I read about how to do best practice of education um, for my youth in my community was not written about. And I realized at that time that it was important for me to uh, 
pursue um, my PhD degree um, in the area of special ed so I can be one of the individuals sitting at the table um, to think about how we use our critical consciousness um, to facilitate movement and agency on behalf of our communities, um, and in this case, education. Uh, so in short, you know, uh, my parents, my brother, um, those that I've, um, you know, interacted with along my journey, um, you know, and, and currently in the academic world, you know, the previous panelists on, in our symposiums, multiple symposiums, um, and, and, and the continuing relationship that we develop here today. So, um, you know, that's, that's kind of, you know, the things that influence me right now. Um, as, as a good colleague of mine, Dr. Amanda Ticini would say, what lights your fire? You know, and so those are the things that light my fire. Um, so thank you very much, Dr. Marin. Thank you, Dr. Joseph. I'm sure I and many other people are glad that you have a seat at the table. Thank you for sharing your story. Um, Dr. Subzalian, would you like to share next? Thank you so much. Uh, and I just want to start by echoing um, appreciation and gratitude for being here and for Drs. Brayboy and Marin and Ben for um, inviting us and creating this opportunity. And I've been watching the other webinars, um, such big shoes to fill, such important insights to carry with us and responsibilities to uphold. So just starting with some gratitude. Um, so Chamai Hui Leilani Sabzalian. Um, little shout out to my Alutic uh, Learning Language Club that is helping me with my introductions. You know, I'm Alaska native, I'm Alutic, but I was born and raised in Oregon. And so reclaiming some language and traditions looks different, right? When you, when you grow up outside of your homelands and your home community, and in my case, even my home, right? I was adopted. Um, so a big part of my work is to figure out what it means to live responsibly as a Native person that's not Native to this place. And I think that has a lot to offer, you know, non-Native people as well. Um, and like Dr. Shirley and, and Joseph said, there's so many entryways into this question um, that you opened us up with. So it's hard to trace my entryways into this work, but I thought about a few kind of people and moments that inspired me. Um, one of those people is Dr. Ku Kakalau. She's a Native Hawaiian scholar and educator and founder of Kanu Oka Aina, which is a Native Hawaiian public charter school on the Big Island, where my partner and I taught briefly. Um, and Ku's vision was to develop a school that really valued and perpetuated Native Hawaiian culture. Um, and Kanu Oka Aina was my first experience really with educational self-determination in action. So this was uh, a community just developing and implementing their own educational system, one that was rooted in um, their own values and their own culture and their own knowledge systems. Um, it was a school where students don't just learn about the land, but learn on and with the land and with the ocean and engage in really meaningful and authentic and project-based learning. And so this started out as like a school within a school and became uh, a public charter school as I shared and then has grown really to um, this comprehensive educational experience from birth to elders. Um, so I just continue to be inspired by Dr. Kahakalau's bold vision of pedagogy with Aloha and all the Native Hawaiian educators there that really um, make that vision a reality every day for Native Hawaiian youth. So when I moved back um, to Oregon, I wondered how I might take some of what I learned at that school and apply it to our, our local context. Um, and I realized I couldn't just import their approach, right? Not only because I'm not Native Hawaiian, even though my name is Leilani, um, but also because education should be local and locally responsive. And so my dear friend, Becca at the time, worked as a youth advocate at NAYA, which is an urban Native youth organization in Portland. And so I reached out to the director at the time, uh, Nicole Maher, um, and just to learn about how NEA got started and to think about whether or not we could create something similar in our context. And Nicole was so generous with her time and resources and um, really laid a foundation for me to think about a Native Youth Center where I lived. Um, and so through a community-based effort, 
really along with Native youth who I agree with Dr. Shirley are the key drivers and inspiration for this work, right? We put Native youth at the center and, and things fall into place. Um, so with Native youth and educators and families, we were eventually successful in creating a center. And it wasn't until really reflecting on this question prompt that I, I came to remember Nicole Maher and her generosity and thinking about all the educators at NEA who inspired that idea and planted that seed for what seemed like a far-fetched um, dream to kind of happen. Um, and then today, I, I just am inspired by and learned so much from my colleague, Dr. Michelle Jacob. She's a Yakima educator and writer and professor. Um, we co-direct the Subsequatla program at the University of Oregon together, which is um, similar to the program that Dr. Shirley and Garcia lead. Um, it's a program that prepares Indigenous educators to serve in Indigenous communities. Um, so we work together, but I, I consider Michelle really my mentor. So she um, really models for me how to bring an Indigenous femi feminist ethic into everything that I do. Um, she models for me how to center um, indigenous values and knowledges and commitments in the work that I do, even in the most stifling of institutional spaces. Um, she teaches me that colonialism really shouldn't define our lives and our life work, and that indigenous and decolonizing education should nourish us, um, that it should even be fun. And her book, Yakima Rising, reminds me that it's not enough to just critique uh, colonial relations of power, but we have to work um, with our communities to build power um, and that our communities are already engaged in this work. Um, yeah, and she also teaches me to be courageous and to lean into my responsibilities as an Indigenous scholar um, and to hold public institutions accountable for Indigenous people's education and our priorities. You know, she says often that our students and Indigenous students have already paid for education with their land. So the least these institutions can do is to give them the type of education they deserve. So um, yeah, those are just a few moments and stories and people who I'm, I'm thinking with right now and I'm really grateful for that prompt to express gratitude for, for some people alongside all the brilliant scholars, you know, that have helped shape my career and giving me a platform to kind of further indigenous education. Thank you, Dr. Subzalian. Um, you know, the, the three of you have given us so much to think about, and I really appreciate, um, you know, your message, Leilani, that co colonialism shouldn't and doesn't have to be the center of our work. And the message from you, Daryl, and from you, Valerie, and also from you, Leilani, that indigenous knowledge systems and, and our relationships with community can be the center. I think you've asked us to question, right, what does it mean to live responsibly? What does it mean to live in relations? And I typically think of the four R's as like reciprocity, relationality, responsibility, relevance. I think Gerald, you've added another R, R there, redistribution. And so I'm, I'm thinking about that and I have some questions for you um, later on about that. And um, I wanna go on to our second question. And I think I've, I've done it again and put multiple questions together. So I'm gonna introduce the question a little bit and then um, you all should feel free to respond to whatever part of the question speaks to you. So the center began in a historical moment on the cusp of the civil rights movement. And we are on the cusp of another important historical moment. Our societies face a global pandemic. We continue to witness racial, ethnic, gender, and linguistic violence. At the same time, we have witnessed the power of collective movements and possibilities for social and political transformation. So I would like to encourage the panelists to engage with each other in a dialogue around this set of questions. COVID has shifted schooling and learning arrangements in myriad ways. What lessons do you think indigenous educators and researchers should carry forward from these times? How have these times shaped your own visions for American Indian and Alaska Native and indigenous education 10 or 20 years from now? What can we do either individually, collectively, or structurally for these visions to be realized? Dr. Joseph, would you like to begin? Sure, thank you for that question, Dr. Moran. Um, you know, so we had the opportunity to prepare for this ahead of time, and in doing so, um, I thought about many things, because um, they're, they're great questions. Um, 
you know, and, and I, first of all, you know, my heart is obviously with my family. You know, I have five children and my wife and we are, you know, doing our best and it's impacted us um, with the COVID activities. And, um, you know, I think specifically about our young, one of our younger daughters um, who is now in the first grade and in all likelihood, she's going to complete her first year, her full year of first grade um, completely online. Um, and so, you know, with that, adjustments that we've had to make as a family um, impacted us immediately, but also those changes had permeated into other spaces, you know. So when I think about that, I think about our, our home communities. And when I say that, I say capital H home, um, you know, meaning, you know, those tribal communities are connections to cultural um, responsibilities, um, maintaining connection to kinship. Um, to our extended families, um, you know, through essentially those primary um, uh, cultural home communities that provide those, those support systems. And then I, I thought about, you know, the other piece, and I'm using the, this terminology based off of um, a conceptual model, a, a good a colleague of mine and friend, Dr. Sweeney Winchy, um, had, had wrote about this idea of Nohongvita, you know, self-empowerment and resilience. And in it, we also introduced this idea that there is an essence of our lowercase h home communities, which are these secondary spaces. You know, as we leave our home, com home communities, we're engaged in these spaces where we um, encounter new cultural models, right? How do we navigate through that process? Um, and when I think about COVID, you know, I think about, you know, the day-to-day -day engagements with Western constructs of schooling work, you know, doing research, um, and, and all for the purpose of, in, in most cases, you know, having some type of economic liability, you know, and, and sustaining ourselves. And so in doing that, you know, making these adjustments um, have also occurred immediately. Um, in, in my place of work, you know, we um, engage in uh, teacher preparation programs. Um, you know, this new reality of of uh, virtual um, participation um, has required us to think about, you know, how do we place students in virtual environments who need the face-to-face -to, -face to engage with students to really practice and hone in their skills to become teachers um, in, in the educational arena. And so, you know, that brings to mind, you know, what, what about our Indigenous students um, who are in our programs pursuing uh, the, the field of uh, becoming an educator, um, you know, there are a lot of disparities we recognize and in, in COVID highlighted, you know, access to technology, um, limited services to Wi-Fi. Um, you know, these things have forced us to think about, you know, on a broader macro level, how we've seen the significant forces of transition and changes occurring with respect to um, as you mentioned, um, Dr. Marin, the racial, ethnic, gender, and linguistic violence, but also political violence um, to which our indigenous communities are not immune to. Um, and so, you know, as we think about that, it, it has all impacted our children and our youth in, a, in very direct ways. Um, so as, as we think about that, um, it reminded me of a time, um, actually when I was back, you know, in my first um, engagement with uh, AIO, um, it, it, it drew me to make connections with my late grandfather, Harmon Kwanviyama, uh, um, and ask him a similar question. And that was, you know, um, you know, to ask him, um, 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 like, what do you envision for the future of our children? You know, what do you see out there? And, you know, as many of our elders do, um, you sit and you wait, you know, you sit and you wait. And, and he thought and he thought, and he said one thing to me at that time. And he said, meaning that, um, you know, it was complicated. It was difficult and it required careful consideration. So there wasn't one answer to that. Um, and so with that said, I think as educators and researchers, we must be intentional 
um, with carefully considering the complexities of our current dynamic um, with respect to cultural and community values um, instilled by our histories. You know, and how do we take that and envision the role of education for our future generations? It's a collective effort. Um, you know, so, so a couple of key points um, to, to think about, I, I feel, are this idea of flexi flexibility. Um, you know, with, with COVID, we've witnessed the challenges um, with access again to technology. Um, very directly, you know, I work with um, uh, an initiative in the Hopi schools right now where we're um, bringing our schools to really address how do we unify um, our systems of education and to support our youth. And we're learning that, you know, there are myriad issues of, you know, sus sustaining student attendance. So we see teachers, you know, finding innovative ways to keep the engagement of youth um, in their home communities to, to receive their education, right? We're finding that access is very limited. So people, students are missing out on education. Um, and so as we think about that flexibility um, with how education is done is, is an important consideration. Um, listening to understand and empower is another um, key component I think is very important. Um, I think on the very other side of the spectrum, um, you know, education doesn't operate in isolation. Um, and I think our previous um, panelists, I particularly, um, you know, I heard about, you know, this idea of economic, I mean, academic wellness. Um, I, I'm currently doing some work with the, the, the role of, um, you know, COVID and impacts on mental health of our youth. Um, and we're seeing this use of technology that facilitates both resilience, but also introduces risk factors that impact mental health. And I'm learning a lot about the role of cyberbullying um, within our communities. And so as, you, as we think about you know, COVID and the impacts and what we're learning, I think you know, the value of what we're going through now, it really speaks to the mindset that um, you know, we have to listen uh, to our youth and engage their voices so that they have agency in how we're creating these systems of education. Um, I really liked what Dr. Bolio had said earlier. He said, you know, we're, we're always thinking, that we're always going through reform. You know, it's constant reform over and over again, and there's no continuity in that. And so as we think about our educational, our communities, we have to find that continuity um, in, you know, in how we're sustaining the cultural and social aspects of our community um, at, with respect to the focus on our children and our families. Um, and so lastly, I just, I just want to add also, also that, you know, this relational value system uh, to maintain that social and cultural continu continuity in our communities. Um, it means that students finding our voice for agency is creating that space for change. Um, carrying the responsibility to recognize this really cultivates this idea of redistribution, um, the, redistributing the teachings and knowledge systems of our local communities. Um, and so we all have responsibility in that. Um, and and I, those are just a couple of things that I, that I thought about, um, you know, in a short time that we can share here, I think are essential as we think about moving forward with, with education. So wanted yeah. to offer that for the time Thank being. You, Dr. Joseph. Yeah. Dr. Shirley or Dr. Sizalian, would you like to weigh in? I think uh, just based off of what uh, Daryl had mentioned about COVID exposing some of the challenges and inequities in our communities, there are also teachers who are approaching the situation in innovative ways. And, you know, and I'd like to kind of just highlight some, some teachers who are doing that. And, you know, this offers some like visions for the future that we could really think through in, in terms of framing how we could draw on our indigenous knowledge systems to move forward in these kinds of times. So we have um, Adrian Jopek, who is a teacher at Ojo Amarillo uh, Elementary School in Fruitland, New Mexico. She shared how she integrated the Diné creation stories with her sixth grade students and used various platforms like Google Maps to plot the journey of the twins. Uh, 
in our creation stories. And then there's Samuel Tanakongva, who's a Hopi teacher at First Mesa Elementary School in Palaka, Arizona. He disrupted the imposed borders of the res with his fourth grade students. And um, because he would often hear them say that they were from the res. And so he developed a curriculum around disrupting and dismantling um, relationships, you know, those kinds of imposed borders. And his curriculum that he implemented virtually, it focused on Hopi's relations to land that went beyond the reservation borders. Mm -hmm. And he shared cultural knowledge, stories, and songs throughout the process of teaching. And he ended the unit by taking students on a virtual field trip to some of those different sites. And so I think, you know, just thinking about these teachers, they really speak to how we can draw on our indigenous knowledge systems and our philosophies to carry us forward in, in, in times like this. Thank you, Valerie. Leilani, would you like to jump in? Yeah, oh, I just appreciate those examples so much. Um, yeah, I think there's, you know, so many lessons that can be taken from this moment. And, um, you know, one key takeaway, and it's a point that's been made by many scholars, including Dr. Lee Patel and Dr. Megan Bang, um, among others, is that schooling and education are not the same thing. Um, and this point is also illustrated so beautifully in uh, Dr. Tim San Pedro's new book, Protecting the Promise, um, in which he shares stories of indigenous education between mothers and children. Um, so, you know, schools and in particular, just the colonial and bureaucratic policies that guide them really stifle educational possibilities and too often harm our youth. And this is happening even in virtual schooling, right? Where schools are sometimes just rooted in and reproducing practices that discipline and that punish and control our students and, and BIPOC students in particular. Um, but that's not the same as education, right? And learning comes so naturally to our youth. It's one of their greatest gifts. And we've seen all sorts of beautiful stories during the pandemic and, and many people have had them in their own families of kids learning new skills and creating systems of mutual care and aid and creating masks and, and gifting them to one another. Um, and so I think a key takeaway, and again, it's not a new insight, but it's just the idea that we have to really reclaim education and the practice of learning and to be answerable to learning, which is what Dr. Patel calls that. Um, so there's this beautiful line in Dr. Gregory Cajete's book, Indigenous Community. And he says, the ideal education is like air. It's natural, spontaneous, original, creative, and naturally spiritual. Natural education unfolds like play. Indeed, it's a form of play, he says. It's not bounded, weighed down with dogma. It is free. Um, and I just, I really love that guiding vision and value of education. So when I think, you know, as you asked in the prompt about what indigenous education looks like 10 or 20 years from now, I really want education to be rooted in learning and I want it to be like the air, you know, just a natural part of um, indigenous children's lives. And, and we're in a moment in which some of this transformation feels possible. So all of a sudden resources like laptops and iPads and hotspots are suddenly available. Um, in some cases, high, high stakes tests are suddenly cancelable. Um, and so it feels like there's a moment to reclaim education. And to do this, I feel like indigenous educators should be leading this effort, um, not just for indigenous education, but really for public education. And, you know, I learned this from Mohawk scholar John Barrows, um, and he says with respect to Canada that Aboriginal people should not just advocate for control of Aboriginal affairs, but the Aboriginal people should have a say in Canadian affairs. And so if I'm looking forward to the future 10 or 20 years from now, you know, I think that Indigenous education should be the driver of all public education. So as an example, you know, I talked about Kanu Oka'aina, that public Hawaiian charter school, 
And not all students there are Native Hawaiian, but all students at the school do learn about and are committed to Native Hawaiian land and perpetuating Native Hawaiian language and culture. And each student, whether or not they're Native Hawaiian, benefits from that land-based and project-based curriculum. Um, so it's, it's always a careful balance, right? We need Indigenous students um, to be our priority when we think about Indigenous education, but then I also believe all students benefit when we place Indigenous education at the heart of our work. Um, and and thinking, thinking about the pandemic and, and what people need in this moment, you know, I think really that Indigenous values should also be the driver of the types of values that we're instilling in, in children in school. So the idea, you know, of relationality, of mutuality, this idea that our lives and futures are bound together and, and the responsibilities that come with that knowledge. I think those are exactly the types of knowledges and skills that our children need. Um, and indigenous communities and educators, I think are well positioned to kind of put into practice those models and, and those values. Thank you, Leilani. Um, I really ap appreciate this idea that you've introduced, right? That indigenous education can also drive and motivate where we go in public education. And I wanna to return to this question of vision and, and also think about what you just shared, Leilani. And Valerie, I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to how we develop the full potential of indigenous education and public education, you know, both within and outside of Western schools, within reservations, with outside of reservations, and, and what are some of the things that you're doing right now to help develop the full potential of indigenous education? That's a good question. And, and I think, you know, I think it's really grounded in this idea of a native nation building. When we think about what that would mean in our communities, I mean, there are public schools in our native communities as well. And when we have teachers who really embrace that intellectual sovereignty within their classrooms, what they're doing is they're preparing the students to work toward this idea of native nation building because um, native nation building problematizes this idea of Western constructs of political sovereignty um, in legal um, Western terms. And so when we think about nation building, we're, we're thinking about how um, we can get our students and teachers to, to really move forward and in restructuring our, our systems. You know, I, when we have um, sovereignty happening in our, in our native communities, I think the, the structural foundation of that is more, it comes from the Western conceptualizations of political sovereignty, as opposed to our own traditional structures of governing ourselves and based off of our own indigenous epistemologies. And nation building does that, it moves toward, um, restructuring our systems and our institutions and everything that are very much westernized today. We, and sometimes we just have um, sprinkles of indigenous languages within these structures and institutions or um, uh, sprinkles of different concepts, you know, within these um, institutions, but it's not the foundation. And I think when we're thinking about envisioning our futures, we have to really think through that foundation and how we can ground our um, our institutions, you know, our entire communities in our epistemologies. And I think when we, when we're, when we're trying to envision what that means, um, you know, Diné, our epistemology is and there's so many teachings embedded in that and philosophy stories and concepts that if we were to really sit down and think through how we could restructure our schools, um, all the different types of schools that uh, exist on our communities, as well as we have healthcare, um, social services. If we could really think about how we could uh, restructure those um, institutions based off of um, for example, how do, how do we do that? And it requires a dialogue among so many different people, the youth, the knowledge holders, which, is, which are our 
um, our Diné leaders, our Hatathis, and um, you know, numerous individuals who could really work toward that. And so, um, you know, and unfortunately, our communities are, are you know, our, our identities are so um, intertwined with Western thought philosophies and ways of being and doing that it's going to take a process of unlearning all of that in order to move forward together collectively. Yeah. Um, Daryl or Leilani, would you like to share a little bit more about your vision and how we can develop the full potential of Indigenous education moving forward? I can just... Um... You know, from what Dr. Shirley had shared, you know, I really appreciate the component of thinking about this from a nation building approach um, and considering the um, positions we are in politically um, when we think about sovereignty and self determination. Um, you know, I, I think there's really a a value and importance that as we are considering this, we're involving um, the multiple structures within our own tribal communities, as, as Dr. Shirley brought up. Um, and as we said earlier, with respect to uh, the, the way we operate, um, we have you know, our knowledge holders, but we also operate schooling systems within our communities. Um, I also, you know, like the notion that was brought up in a previous uh, webinar with the idea around, you know, demographic shifts of our communities. Uh, I think we um, are experiencing and have been over time, you know, experiencing uh, the shifts in the makeup of our community, you know, and, and with respect to thinking about how many of our Native people live, leave the reservation to uh, pursue a career or education off the reservation and then stay there. Um, and, and that's over half of the population of many tribal communities. Uh, so what does that mean when we speak about, you know, sustaining culture and language locally? Um, and how do we integrate and still provide that sense of belonging for our youth and communities who are in these other locations? Um, I think that's that's really uh, essential and one of the things that we're dealing with. I think also, um, you know, really just kind of making the connection about, you know, this, this idea of cultural knowledge. Um, I like what Dr. Brayboy, if I can call him uncle, uncle Dr. Brayboy, um, you know, says in, in his paper on tribal crit, uh, when he speaks about, you know, this idea of um, cultural knowledge and you know, he says that since we're reading some quotes, I'm going to share what I picked up from him. He says, you know, that in tribal crit culture is simultaneously fluid or dynamic and fixed or stable. Like an anchor in the ocean, it is tied to a group of people and often a physical place. For many indigenous people, culture is rooted to lands on which they live as well as to their ancestors who lived on those lands before them. However, when this, when, just as the anchor shifts and the sways with the changing tides and the ebbs and flows of the ocean, culture shifts and flows with the changes in context, situations, people, and purposes. So like all humans, indigenous people are shaped by their cultural inheritance and they engage in cultural production. And so that says a lot as we are moving forward, you know, uh, you know, that we need to consider not only the micro dynamics of how we're operating within our local communities, but how that operates in relation to these macro dynamics, you know, local, state, federal, internationally. I think there are some promise in that. And, and, and it's, as, as my grandpa said, you know, you know, it takes careful consideration and it's, it's not an easy task. Um, and so that's that's really what I wanted to, to add on and, and share with what Dr. Shirley had contributed. Yeah, you're you're reminding me of, you know, some of Leanne Simpson's work around grounded normativity and indigenous internationalism and drawing on Dr. Brayboy's work, how important places and and our origin stories and our relations to place. But thinking of the last panel, 
I'm, I'm also hearing the voices of, you know, one of my dear friends and colleagues, Megan Bang, um, and, and remembering and wanting to honor and recognize that we're also tied intertribally by our migrations, right? And so Leilani, I, I know you've done a lot of work in um, urban indigenous communities, and I'm wondering if you might speak a little bit to how we can think about indigenous internationalism in relation to either nation building or some of what, what Daryl just said. Yeah, yeah, I really appreciate that question. And then of course also bringing in Dr. Bang's work and her recent contributions on the panel, which have been really uh, influential. Um, also, Daryl, your grandpa, you know, thinking about how careful attention must be given and things are complicated, right? The issues we're dealing with are complex. Um, yeah, you know, I think one thing and, and in responding to, to the quote that you just brought in from Dr. Brayboy about culture, like what does it mean to center land and being in, in right and good relationship with land as a grounding and guiding ethic? for some of the ways that we can be together in place and live our responsibilities. Um, you know, we were thinking about this when we were developing our Native Youth Center, right? Because it was a highly diverse intertribal space and, you know, 50, 80, 80 nations represented, right? But we're on Kalapuya Ilahi, right? The homelands of Kalapuya people and thinking about what does it mean to cultivate an educational space and a center that is attentive to you know, the presence, the ongoing presence and um, ancestral homelands of the people from the Confederated Tribes of Grand Round and the people from the Confederated Tribes of Sluts Indians, but also honors our own roots, right? And I love how um, Scott Lyons talks about, we carry our roots with us, right? So thinking about how to create a space that's both grounded and land and relationality and responsibility and also recognizes the diverse cultures um, and nations that we carry with us. And I, I, I just fall back on Daryl's grandpa that that work isn't easy, you know, and that, um, that Dr. Leanne Simpson, her idea of grounded normativity really guides that. And I'm so glad you brought her into this because I just taught her book and have been thinking so much with her and, and some advice that, um, that Dr. Megan Bain gave me a while ago. And actually she just shared in the last, um, the webinar right about we have to be really thoughtful and careful of what we give our time and attention to and um you know when we're thinking of this idea of building a future of indigenous education um we need to be real careful that colonialism isn't hijacking our time and energy and you know megan bang told me this i hear it in leanne simpson's work about being thoughtful about what we're doing in the present because that builds that type of future that we're thinking about bringing into being and I only share that story too, because even with my own kind of developing critical indigenous consciousness, as Dr. Shirley says, and Dr. Lee has taught us, um, you know, I've sometimes equated contesting colonialism as this critical indigenous consciousness, but that's that, that you know, as, as Megan Banks says, that steals your time and labor. It turns you into labor. It makes you work for colonialism, even when you're trying to work against it, you know, and, and we have to be careful because when I guide youth, sometimes I've guided them into that very practice. You know, Megan Banks says, rage isn't a good teacher. And I think back on some of the work I've done to help youth be infuriated with the world, you know, but what, that's not a good, good practice. So how can we have that kind of land-based, really diverse um, community? How can we foster that with youth? That, those are live questions for me that I'm thinking about out loud. <laughs> Yeah, I think they're live questions for me as well. <laughs> I don't know, Valerie, if you would like to take some of those questions up. In part, I'm asking you because, you know, you so beautifully reminded us what it means to start from our indigenous epistemologies when we're doing the work of and the labor of creating programs with youth and, and for youth. Um, and so I'm thinking again of the theme of this panel, the future of indigenous education and um, our starting points and our beginnings as we continue down this path, both in our home communities and together as, as scholars. Um, so really, I think I'm, I'm asking you, Valerie, what, you know, um, 
I'll ask it this way. Um, what is the beginning of this story that we're beginning to write when we think about the indigenous, uh, the future of indigenous education? That's a beautiful question. And when we think about it in terms of the youth, um, we, we know that we, we want to sustain our indigenous life ways, our epistemologies and all of our stories because there's so much uh, healing and um, strength in all of that. And so uh, we know also what colonialism has done to our communities. And so hi historically, and it's had its impacts on us. And, and um, particularly with the work that I did with Diné youth, we unpack those, that, those histories um, from, from the perspective of truth telling. And that these stories of boarding schools, as well as the Diné long walk period, those stories are not typically told in, in textbooks. And so when we bring those truths and those narratives into the, um, into, into, the, into the space of engaging youth to think critically about their role, about their um, identity. And, you know, we, we, we know that the rage will happen because it did happen with the youth that I worked with. And I, in, in terms of me and what I did was, I drew on our own Diné um, uh, principle of Hojon. And Hojon is really this idea of balance and harmony. And, you know, it, it's, it, it embodies this feeling and emotion that one has. And so it's central to, 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 that, to that concept. And so when we have, um, students thinking critically about this history of colonial violence and what it has done to our communities. We, I, I was intentional in, um, because of my own personal experiences of uncovering those histories and how I felt frustrated and angry. Um, you know, the youth that I worked with, they were around 12 years old, 12 to 14. And so, um, as, as an educator, how would I guide them through that process? Because they would need to know this history and what happened in order to move forward. Um, it's, it's the idea of deconstructing these structures in order to move forward and reconstruction, reconstructing. And so uh, taking them through that process, I learned that um, I needed to always bring in this, um, bring them back to the state of balance emotionally. And it, it had to do with a lot of talking. I integrated some Diné stories, um, creation stories into, into, their, um, into their learning at the time. And so, but I think every, you know, at the very um, moment when they really began to think about their own identities, how they internalize colonialist ideas and practices, they were upset with themselves that they were that was happening you know hegemonically they had no idea that was happening but it really started to bring awareness for them and so um, what they did was you know they were aware they knew they they knew what was happening so they internalized this idea of um, like self-empowerment and self-responsibility to um, move forward in reconnecting and relearning though they started with the creation stories and the languages and the language. So what I learned is that it, it, it takes a lot of um, healing to happen and a lot of dialogues, a lot of time for students or for, for, for the youth to get to the point of um, internalizing the sense of empowerment to move forward together and collectively. And so, you know, I, th I think about that because um, we don't want to leave the youth in that state. Uh, we want to make sure that they're empowered to move forward and to continue making changes within our, within our communities. Thank you, Dr. Shirley. Um, this has been such an engaging conversation and I'm a little saddened that we have to transition in a minute. So I just want to give some, some quick um, comments. Um, first, I want to offer my appreciation and gratitude to you, Dr. Joseph, to you, Dr. Subsalian, and to you, Dr. Shirley, for sharing your stories with us today and for offering the teachings that you have. I heard a lot of 
um, different empowering themes that I want to take with me in my own work and that I will carry forward around flexibility and listening around natural education, around um, native nation building, around teaching from love and our connection to place and our connection to our home communities and especially to our aunties, our uncles, our grandmas, our cousins, our grandpas and the knowledge that we create together. Um, at this time, I will turn the discussion over to Dr. Colin Ben, who will share questions from the chat and other questions that have been submitted through ASU Live and in the registration forms. We'll have about 10 minutes for Q&A and then we'll close. Thank you, Dr. Marin. I'd like to thank the audience who submitted questions for our panel today. The first question is, should indigenous knowledges be taught in mainstream academic institutions? I think to a certain extent, yes. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, it, it's a part of us. It's, it's who we are and it's, it's the center of our identities. And you know, I, when we um, taught a summer class on science concepts, you know, and integrating um, Western concepts of science with indigenous knowledge systems, that's one approach that we took, for example, in preparing these native teachers to be able to do that because embedded in our own communities, we have our own scientists, our own philosophers, our own theorists that have drawn on these indigenous epistemology. So when we talk about, we have to build partnerships and collaborations with the parents and the families, you know, um, that's an approach that could be taken is because is that our uh, families and communities have this knowledge systems. And in order for us to make sense of, you know, some of these Western concepts that drive the academic disciplines, science, for example, um, it could be a balance between the two. Um, we have our own stories around um, air, water, fire, and land, and there's science embedded in that. And so we, for this course specifically, we invited different uh, people who had, um, or different elders and knowledge holders who have, um, you know, those philosophical and traditional stories about each of those, because those are the natural elements that we all are part of. And Daryl, Daryl's father, Harold, was also um, invited to share his knowledge as well. And it was just a beautiful experience because that was actually something we've never done before. But when we put our minds together to think through during the pandemic, what we could do, this was um, last summer, and, you know, I think it really brought to light that within the teacher candidates that there is a place for indigenous epistemologies, but, you know, as native teachers, we also know how much of it can enter into the classroom as well. And a lot of it could be used as curriculum. You know, those, those stories, stories is our curriculum, they're part of curriculum. Um, whether they're our own personal life experience stories or survivance stories, our origin stories um, grounded in our epistemologies can be used as curriculum as well. So that, that's just what I, what I think about, um, that there's possibilities, but to a certain extent. Yeah, I really um, appreciate the answer, Dr. Shirley, that you gave to that question. You know, I think there's dangers in bringing indigenous knowledges into kind of public educational spaces, but with thought and care, they can and, and really should be centered and valued. And um, there's lots of different ways to do that. You know, indigenous literatures is a great way, you know, so published um, and publicly written um, literature is, is a wonderful way to do that. And I'm thinking about uh, Daniel Heath Justice's book, Why Indigenous Literatures Matter. And he talks about how indigenous literature really gets at core questions about humanity, right? So um, how do we learn to be human? How do we behave as good relatives? How do we become 
good ancestors? How do we learn to kind of live together? Um, these are core questions that really, you know, indigenous peoples have beautiful responses to and can, can guide and ground a lot of inquiry in, in public schools. Um, and then also thinking um, Dr. Joseph shared those, those values um, and guiding principles that were uh, shared by LaDonna Harris, you know? And so how beautiful if, if relationality and responsibility and reciprocity and redistribution were kind of educators and students were wrestling with what does that look like in each of the kind of respective local places and lands in which they live. So I think, you know, there's a lot of opportunity with thought and care because we know so often that universities and public schools want to kind of co-opt or commodify um, our knowledge systems or even kind of trick us into performing, right? Rather than engaging that kind of deep, substantial, um, inquiry that our communities are grounded in. I'll just, I'll just add both to both Dr. Shirley's and Subzalian's comments. Um, I think it really, you know, it, to contextualize that some more, it depends on who you ask, right? And so you think about my community back here, I go home and ask that question. Um, you, you're going to get responses on the spectrum. And I think, you know, what was presented as a, approaches to identify the opportunities um, in doing so to incorporate indigenous knowledge systems into the institutional structures um, as opportunities to build and sustain our cultural knowledge systems um, is really a, a great approach, you know, thinking about relationality. Um, and taking that approach as we move forward, uh, I think is one way to address that question, you know, in terms of the context of communities you're working with, um, locations, um, you know, I know for at least for the Hopi community, we're doing a research project. Um, and there's so many complexities, complexities in the sense that, you know, you have um, you know, the operation of a tribal system where you have a tribal government but you also have sovereign villages. So the tribal governments don't make decisions for sovereign villages, right? So you gotta go to the villages themselves. Um, and so we still have those contexts that are still very prevalent among indigenous communities. Um, and then we also have those demographic shifts as we talked about earlier, you know, those who are in very urban contexts um, where, you know, responses may differ. So I, I don't think it's a one size fits all um, response. You know, I think really we need to consider and value and respect, um, you know, the, the spaces we're asking those questions in and, and take the appropriate steps to involve those decision makers um, to, to make that decision. Thank you for your responses. The second question is, how do we work with our colleagues in the academy to use indigenous data in decision-making processes throughout campus? Dr. Bing, can you ask that question again? I'm sorry. Sure. How do we work with our colleagues in the academy to use indigenous data in decision-making processes throughout campus? And that's, that's a, another broad, very difficult question to answer. And I think my response is similar to the response with indigenous knowledge systems. Um, you know, there's a lot of work out there on the concept of data sovereignty um, and, and respecting, um, you know, how data is collected, um, how it's used and the potential use for, of it for future engagement in, in research activities. Uh, and so, you know, you know in, in I, I would think many universities that are in, lo in, in locations um, local to indigenous communities, you, you, we may have more of an awareness about how decisions are made about data. 
you know, and how we use it um, versus universities that don't have nearby nor, nearby communities that are um, culturally engaged and have tribal communities there. Um, that this may be a you know as not even a thought in the process, and so. Um, again, I, 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 my thought is that, you know, there, there, the work, there's plenty of work to be done to inform how we go about making decisions with that um, as, it, as respect to data sovereignty and then finding ways. I think Dr. Shirley and Dr. Garcia have a great story about, you know, Purdue and the cultural center there, um, which kind of entails that experience, you know, that, you um, you know, where do we start from? We got to start from somewhere. And, and I, I like, you know, that, you know, that story is there to demonstrate that uh, we, we need to affirm and reaffirm the, the knowledge systems that we have as true and value. I think, you know, sometimes we think about it in, as in tribal crit, the way they speak about it is this idea of it being mythology and it's not, right? Mm -hmm. our, our knowledge systems are not mythology. They are in fact theory. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have to hold it as that and, and recognize it as we're working with indigenous communities and collecting data in that manner and respect it that way. Mm. Yeah, um, I could add that, you know, I think working with our colleagues in universities or even K-12 schools, um, helping them recognize the ways that indigenous erasure uh, is reproduced through kind of demographic collecti collecting and reporting requirements and processes on campuses and in K-12 districts is really important. So just thinking about how indigenous students are erased through the Hispanic and Latino ethnicity or often they're erased through the kind of two or more races or multiracial demographic category that gives the illusion of there being less native students than there actually are. Um, and oh, uh, Heather Shotton and um, Waterman and Lo have a beautiful book Beyond the Asterisk, which I think is really required reading. But then also, you know, helping our colleagues move away from the idea that a demographic imperative is what should support and drive indigenous educational work, right? The idea that we have a big population and for that we need to meet the need rather than understanding that it's a responsibility. And, and I just appreciate Dr. Joseph always bringing it back to kind of context and complexity. There's, you know, no simple answers driving that. At the University of Oregon, you know, our subsequent law, uh, teacher education program is run in consortium with the nine federally recognized tribal nations um, in the state of Oregon. And so the university has a responsibility on our campus to support students. And, and it's not about whether or not we have a really big cohort of students. It's about kind of an institutional responsibility to uphold um, and respect and be in good relationship with the tribal nations in the state. Um, and that's hard for people to understand sometimes when we're a statistical minority, right? When we're, when we're a statistical minority, then we're kind of disregarded, especially in the, the K-12 public schools that I'm working in where native students are just one or two students in their classrooms. I, I think for time's sake, we're going to need to move on. I'm sorry, Dr. Shirley. Um, as, we, as we move on, I just, again, want to express my gratitude and thanks to all of you. This has been a wonderful discussion rooted in our stories of relations enriched by our panelists' deep well of experiences and expertise and looking forward critically and optimistically to the future. I deeply appreciate the questions that were raised in our session today. How can we design teaching and learning contexts grounded in our original teachings? And how do we do this work in ethical and responsible ways. I also appreciate the themes that continue to come out in the discussion, um, being in, in relations with our relatives, respect, reciprocity, redistrib redistribution, context, complexity, and centering lands, waters, and youth in the work that we do. Many, many thanks to our panelists and to all of you who have joined us today. I want to make two quick plugs. The first is to bring to your attention the online master's degree in indigenous education that is housed at ASU. It is a 30 hour program that can be completed in two years. And I want to remind you of the fifth and final webinar in the 60th year celebration webinar series. 
Mentoring the Next Leaders of Indian Education. It will be held on April 23rd, 2021 from 1 to 2.30 p.m. Mountain Time. Three Indigenous scholars will be featured on the panel. Dr. Teresa Ambo Tongvan Luceno is an assistant professor at the University of California, San Diego. Dr. Jameson Lopez, a member of the Kashan tribe, is an assistant professor at the University of Arizona. And Dr. Amanda Tuccini Dene is an assistant professor at Arizona State University. Dr. Colin Ben Dene, Associate Director of the Center for Indian Education, will be moderating. On behalf of the Center for Indian Education 60th Planning Committee, I express sincere thanks to our distinguished panelists for this inspiring discussion. And I thank you, our guests. We hope to see you again for our fifth webinar. Mark your calendars for April 23rd. Until then, stay safe and be well. Thank you. <laughs>